Good. All right. Well, good afternoon. I'm Jason Karlowich. I'm uh, on faculty here in the School of Medicine, uh, and uh, I co-direct the Penn Memory Center with my uh, friend and colleague, David Wolk, where I just came from seeing a few patients, and uh, in between do a variety of research projects looking at issues uh, around uh, how we're going to live well with our uh, aging brains, particularly when those brains are affected by diseases like Alzheimer's. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've got a great panel um, who I'm going to uh, engage in a, in a conversation. And at around about 3 o'clock, uh, we'll pivot it over to you uh, for uh, audience uh, question and answer, which I'll moderate. And I'll uh, exercise a... Uh, a <laughs> going to make a joke about the Speaker of the House effort to bring order to the House. And whatever, but I thought that was probably a little bad taste on other levels. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so I've got joining me uh, 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 my friend and colleague, George Damaris, who's the Mary Alice Bennett University professor here at Penn with joint faculty appointments in the Department of Behavioral Health Sciences uh, in the School of Nursing and the Informatics Division in the Departments of Biostatistics, Epidemiology, and Informatics. Uh, George is internationally recognized for his work studying innovative ways to use technology to support older adults in various settings, including not just the hospital, but uh, the home. Um, and I know George well because he is the PI of an NIA-funded uh, 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 site here at Penn for what's called the AI Tech Collaboratory, um, which is dedicated to promoting uh, through the use of small uh, targeted grants, uh, the applications of AI-based technology to improve the lives of older adults, particularly older adults living with neuro neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Next uh, is uh, Rajiv uh, Ajuja from the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging, who manages the Institute's Alliance to Improve Dementia Care, an alliance that I'm a member of. He leads efforts to incentivize policy, business, and technology-based approaches to promote brain health combat stigma, reduce costs, and bridge health and economic disparities. I think you're seeing a theme here. Mm -hmm. Next is Kelly O'Brien, Vice President for Prevention from Us Against Alzheimer's. Um, she leads their team working on efforts to support business, healthcare professionals, and policymakers with information, resources, and ideas to promote healthy aging and assure brain span equals lifespan. Not just a clever play on words, but an incredibly ethically charged idea. And then Mitchell uh, Elkin, uh, a professor of neurology and epidemiology at Columbia University and past president of the American Heart Association. That's all I'm going to say about him because he's going to get the first question. Um, so we're here talking about the brain, Mitch, but the brain exists in an environment. And by environment, I don't mean what we quickly would think of, which is just place, but place and people and also a body that the brain is attached to or the body attaches to the brain. We could debate that. So um, here we are. You are the uh, president of the past president of the American Heart Association. You're not misplaced um, uh, uh, to be a heart association person here talking about the brain. What I'd like to begin with is to have you uh, tell us, mindful that the body has a heart, what are some ways that the heart and the brain work together to keep the brain healthy and how might we design a community that helps the heart keep the brain healthy? And I want to emphasize community. You're not allowed to talk about statins, blood pressure pills, or any other biomedical intervention. I want you to talk about why the brain keeps the heart healthy and what can the community do to keep the brain healthy via the heart. Sure. Great, great question. And uh, thank you. And thank you to uh, Michael and Zab for, for having me and the Heart Association here. So. Uh, it's true that I'm a professor of neurology, of uh, vascular neurology, which means I take care of stroke patients. Uh, and uh, I'm an epidemiologist, and I've been a professor at Columbia for the last 25 years. But in fact, I, I now work for the American Heart Association, which um, I'm, I'm the chief clinical science officer there now. I was president a couple of years ago. That's OK. I was president a couple of years ago. And uh, after my term, which coincided with the pandemic, so I didn't get to do all the great brain stuff I was hoping to do there, I decided to take a full-time job at heart, which I think speaks to the commitment of the Heart Association to uh, brain health and uh, brain, brain capital as well. And so, um, yeah, I, I would say, um, first of all, you can't have brain capital without brain health, and you can't have brain health without health. You can't have brain health 
without cardiovascular health in particular. You need a strong heart, clean lungs, a competent immune system in order for the brain to function normally and well. Uh, and so we think about it very holistically. I think, you know, that's probably pretty self-evident. The reverse of that, I think, is evident to most of the people in this room, but maybe not to the general public, that you can't have heart health or body health, cardiovascular health, without brain health either. So we know, for example, that people who have mental illness smoke more. Right? People who have depression, have high blood pressure. They may not take their medications. They certainly don't get enough physical activity and do all the other things that are good for the heart. So those are clearly related to each other. So let's push it. So how can the community... I would go... Well, I'll get there. All right. I'll get there. I'll get there quickly. I get it. You want me to go past it? So I do. I'll take, it, I'll, take it, I'll take that one step further, which is, you know, there is evidence also that uh, brains... When people are together, their brains actually can resonate. They fire synchronously with each other. And so what that tells us is that it's not just a question of a healthy brain in an individual even, but it's healthy brains. When we think about brain health, brain capital, we should really be thinking about brains health. It's a question of um, could be you know, a, a partnership, a family, a society, community, and so forth. And to take it one step further than that, I would say you can't have health and therefore not brain health or brain capital if you don't have uh, clean air, places to exercise, you know, green spaces, healthy food, access to health care, um, and all the things that are so important in creating a community and a society more broadly. So we have learned at the Heart Association, and we focus more and more on this, that it's not only a question of looking out from the heart to the other organs within the body, but it's a question of looking in the other dimension as well, orthogonally, to the entire community. You can't have a, a healthy heart or a healthy brain without a healthy community and society. So and I think as a society, like this idea, you know, uh, not idea, but the policies like uh, smoking bans. Um, I just left the hospital area where there's a strict ban within the perimeter of the hospital. I saw it being enforced in a rather dramatic way. Um, we all think, oh, of course, smoking bans, that's good for the heart. But what we're saying is that a smoking ban is also good for the brain. And all these things that we've done to help our brain, we should think about how, how our heart, how they help our brain. Absolutely. Which takes me to the brain more directly, Rajiv. So I have a brain that's damaged by amyloid plaques and tau tangles, or in a word, Alzheimer's disease. So now we're in the brain. So the result is that there's impairments in cognitive skills, uh, or a decline in brain capital, or what my field would call dementia. Um, and uh, what I'd like to ask now is, in addition to the drugs that treat Alzheimer's, how can technology improve that damaged brain's capital and make it, I'll be a little provocative, worth more, if you will, if we're going to play this capital term to its hilt? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. It's, it's been a wonderful day, and I think I'm excited to present our kind of collective perspective on the importance of focusing on uh, older adults uh, within this conversation on brain health. Um, we know, given demographic changes around the world, in my opinion, population aging is you know, the story of our lives, along with climate change. And within that story is uh, the story of our, our brain health. And Jason, like you mentioned, a lifetime of accumulated uh, damage to our brain, which starts in early childhood, continues through midlife and, and kind of starts to show damage, um, you know, when we turn 65, even beforehand, um, results in a lot of uh, neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, which is something that we focus on at the Milken Institute, um, and really requires a holistic effort um, given the progressive nature of dementia. So I think technology definitely plays a role, but... I think we have to take a step back first and really um, understand how high touch, high need dementia care is. Um, technology can play certainly a role um, given emerging drug treatments that are coming up. Um, it can play a role in early detection. Um, and there's global efforts uh, going on right now through organizations like the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative to identify what 
emerging technologies can, can detect dementia as early as possible or detect cognitive de decline as early as possible. And there's exciting uh, tools. Um, there's uh, eye scans that, that can detect uh, dementia early on. There's new blood biomarkers that are coming up that, you know, I think are important because they give us uh, an earlier window for other interventions that are that, that are available to slow the progress of, of cognitive decline. Um, and so I think, you know, when we talk about technologies again, you know, there's technologies that help with safety, um, you know, GPS related technologies that, that help with wandering. There's health related technologies uh, that help with things like medication reminders um, that help with uh, memory uh, enhancement programs, you know, to help us build our cognitive resilience. Um, there's voice activated assistance uh, that's being developed and in places like Japan that are, is a super aging society, those types of technologies are, um, you know, having a lot of benefit not only to patients uh, who are able to have um, engagement, have interaction with, you know, these, these technologies that, that are incorporating AI that can respond in a way that continues a conversation that helps with uh, your cognitive resilience, but it also helps caregivers. And I think, you know, with regards to, you know, the technology, um, technologies that help support caregivers in uh, the dementia, uh, dementia care continuum, I think are, are really key. Um, I don't think any other chronic condition really relies on uh, the services of family caregivers as much as dementia. And again, the progressive nature of the disease really puts a huge burden on caregivers who, you know, two thirds of which are women. It's a social justice issue because, you know, women, um, daughters, you know, are, are supportive, supportive women in your family are the you know, number one uh, uh, help for slowing cognitive decline which places a lot of responsibility on, on women. They're also- so, so that's a great public policy issue, and we're gonna to pivot to uh, Kelly in a moment, but you've started to build a, 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 a gesture to a, variety, a repertoire of a variety of technologies here, both for patients and also for caregivers, which when I think technology, I think of George, and when I, especially when I think about, never mind medical technologies and ICUs and whatnot, but in the home. So George, what insights do we have about Rajiv sort of gestured to a host of technologies. What insights do we have about the various technologies that can be used that um, can allow someone to outfit a home that keeps the brain healthy in spite of disease, in spite of disease? Yeah, I think I hope it's pretty You're good. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for that question. I think there is opportunities now with technology to look at the home as a place that can actually provide additional support. We often talk about smart homes, and that term used to be in the 80s referring to just energy efficient buildings. But uh, more lately, we see with the emergence of Internet of Things devices and other advances in technology that we can actually have a residential infrastructure that has features that support quality of life and well being for residents and their families. So, um, think about using even uh, low cost, commercially available sensors to promote passive sensing that can help you tell how long a person is spending inside, whether they're in bed or they're having visitors or leaving their home, uh, whether they're engaging in meal preparation, or whether the time that they spend uh, not moving around keeps increasing, restlessness at night, bathroom visits. The goal, obviously, with these technologies is not to have a human at the other end watch those data points come in real time, but rather to develop the efficient algorithms that can detect certain patterns where you can intervene and have a perhaps more proactive approach. So rather than waiting for the adverse event to happen and then try and minimize the side effects or the, the implications, perhaps with the home infrastructure we can do things to keep people safe at home, uh, but also monitor their well-being. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, examples of smart home implementations that show that when applied appropriately and obviously with a human element in the loop, we can keep people at home safer and promote independence and aging in place. 
there's obviously other technologies in addition to sensors, um, voice interfaces like you mentioned, or other tools we can implement in the home, like cognitive orthotics, where you have things that remind you of the context of things. So for example, you know, widely used tools like showing you on the phone who it is that you're calling and providing a small summary of how you know this person or the context. Um, or, or a combination of wearables and passive sensing technology. So there are great opportunities, but obviously, when we think about these technologies in the home, what makes it different than, let's say, technologies in a hospital setting is how do we ensure that these technologies are not obtrusive and how do we honor people's wishes for privacy while also balancing that with the need to keep people safe. How do we address when there might be a misalignment in preferences between an older adult with some cognitive impairment and a family member who may want more and more frequent monitoring? Um, and then finally, I would say, as we think about this great potential that technologies have, we do need to think about health disparities. Specifically in the smart home space, oftentimes you are assuming an infrastructure at home, whether it's uh, Wi-Fi broadband or other tools, and that, those may be available to people who already have access to services, further exacerbating inequities. So obviously technology, in my mind, is quite promising when we think about the home and the community setting, and especially now with generative AI, we have endless opportunities, but we need to more proactively address those ethical and clinical implications rather than have a technology drive the solution. You know, when I think about the role of technology in the home setting for the brain, I kind of think about, you know, um, if one had mobility deficits, you have a host of ways that technologies are designed to eliminate a mobility deficit, you know, ramps instead of stairs, elevators, escalators, uh, doors that open courtesy of uh, uh, radar as opposed to having to even push it, and on and on and on. Um, and disability from diseases like Alzheimer's is disability not because of physical, but of cognitive problems. And there's a host of technologies that can help the brain function well despite problems. Um, I'm holding one in my hand right now. Um, all you need to do is lose this or misplace it uh, for a day and realize how dependent you are on this for your working memory, positionality, et cetera. Um, so we've been kind of at the sort of meso, we got community level a bit. I want to take this up to the policy level. Um, Kelly, um, you uh, uh, are an advocate for um, a world where brain span equals lifespan. Um, for in an organization that advocates at a policy level in particular. So let's go there. What should the federal government do with Medicare, the CDC, FDA, or any of its other healthcare delivery infrastructure regulatory bodies? I'm giving you open season to say, what should they do to ensure that brain span equals lifespan? You don't know what open season looks like for me. Bye. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, thanks, Jason. Got five really, minutes. <laughs> it's great to be here, and I'll try to talk fast, as I always do. I really appreciate the invitation, and um, Harris, uh, I always appreciate you um, cluing me into this fantastic program at Wharton. Um, I just want to step back for one second and say, why are we talking about dementia and Alzheimer's and aging at, a, at Wharton at the School of Business? And why is this important for us? And I don't think that the answer to that is just new technologies for people that are getting older. I think part of the answer is in Raj's um, uh, point that he made about an aging population. We're going to have more people over the age of 50 and 60 than under 18, and we have a workforce shortage. Right. And we need to keep people working. And people want to work. Um, McKinsey did a recent study. People want to work. And not only do they want to work, when they do work, their brains work better. Mm -hmm. They're healthier. And so keeping people in the workforce and helping them stay in the workforce is a really important issue, not only for our economy, but it's also really important for our brains. And part of the reason that as an Alzheimer's organization that we're interested in this is because we were one of the key advocates for what they call affectionately now goal six of the National Alzheimer's plan, which is to add a goal to our national plan to end Alzheimer's that focuses on preventing this thing from happening in the first place. So promote healthy aging and reduce the risk factors for dementia. And we believe that one of the key ways to do that based on the research is to start early at birth. So everything we've been talking about today, it's like your retirement account. It compounds. It starts. The earlier you start, the better it is. It's never too late to put money in the bank, health money in the bank. It's never too late to take care of your heart, to get better sleep. 
the earlier you do it, the better it is, and the more likely we are to reduce the risk of dementia in older ages. So when you ask me about what the government can do, one of the things that Us Against Alzheimer's is interested in is not only making this a national priority or a global priority to think about brain health not just as a health issue but as an economic issue, but also we think the private sector has a really important role to play in this. We think that businesses have a vested interest in being involved in this, and we've started a new uh, business collaborative for brain health to engage major companies like Shell, like Kroger, many others in this effort to think about what their role is, not only just as a, it's not about just adding a well-being program, right? People are sort of been there, done that. But this is like a, this is an imperative for national competitiveness, for economic sustainability. And we just think it also along the way, if we, if we go there, we're going to kick Alzheimer's off as we go, right? Like, so we're going to accomplish what we want to accomplish by lifting everybody up. Can I ask yeah. a question? I'm going to give you the last word. Oh, uh, so I was just wondering, you know, this morning we heard about AI, right, and the potential yeah. for AI to take away jobs, and now you're talking about putting people to work for even longer periods of time in their life, which I agree is probably good for their brains, but those seem like two, uh, you know, opposing forces. What, what kind of jobs are those people going to get if the you know, high-level jobs are taken over by AI. What are they going to do? I didn't hear that they were going to be losing more jobs. I heard their jobs were going to change, and that it was more important that people had the intellectual ability to be doing the analysis and the ethics and the kind of work that it's going to take to help manage AI, right? And that takes our brains. So I didn't hear that it was less people in the workforce. I heard that it was a different kind of skill that was more knowledge-based. And to me, that's an argument for why this is so important. Can I, yeah. can I quickly also, I yeah. think when we talk about working longer, we're talking about um, not a traditional sense of working longer. I think, you know, we're enjoying longer and longer lifespans. When you retire at 65, you potentially have 30 years to reinvent yourself. You have time to retrain yourself. You have time to do passion projects. You have time to um, give back to the community that you're in. And I think that expanded definition of work is something that we need to um, promote. On the other hand, working an extra year, I mean, it really depends on what type of job you're not everybody wants to work longer. But, you know, I think from a brain capital perspective, if we're looking to put brain health at the top of all of these policy agendas, you know, it really does impact uh, economics at a national level. They show in the UK, extending one, extending your, your um, you know, a healthy work span by one year, working one year longer has been shown to increase GDP by 1%. So companies are, you know, companies, countries that can um, prioritize brain health as a way of increasing productivity in a manner that's humane and the way that people want to want to do it has the, um, we huge have, implications. Yeah, I'll give you one other example in the employment space or workspace in general. We have a program uh, a festival, actually, that's going to start next year, 2024, called the Arts on the Mind Festival. You can look that up. Brought by in cooperation with the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Chamber Music Society. And the goal of the, uh, of the festival is to show the many ways that the arts maintain, preserve, and promote brain health, and not just mere entertainment, but they have a role there. Well, if you think about all the arts organizations that are out there, libraries, concert halls, et cetera, sit unoccupied for much of the time of the day, et cetera, Libraries could be re-envisioned for a role uh, in uh, brain health. Uh, for example, um, the role of memory cafes in a library, uh, something that we think of them as, well, they're in church basements, et cetera. So take a look, Arts on the Mind. Uh, there's four programs at the Franklin Institute to kick it off where just this topic will be brought up with an idea to the role that society can have in the arts. I want to open it up for questions now. There's one right there. So I have a question that uh, more pertains to uh, Rajiv and Kelly. Uh, so I'm a, one of the co-founders of a startup that focuses on accomplished professionals repurposing their lives. So there you go. Um, four years into it. But uh, anyway, the question is that you've got these, uh, you were talking to Rajiv about these tools that uh, are exciting tools about cognitive resilience. Uh, are they, uh, more can you apply them to more mission, less mission critical applications, such as what we're building? 
meaning for retirement purposes or reskilling or yeah so yeah we we're talking more about we position is less about retirement and more post your post career years so these are people who are foregoing um, traditional retirement because they because they, they know it's good for their minds so um, so if you apply that same technology to something that's not just well it is inter interrelated to health health uh, reasons but just something more mainstream I mean, I think we're definitely in the process of redefining what retirement is in the U.S. Um, I don't think that, um, you know, a, a traditional retirement where you stop working and, and, and play golf for 30 years is something that is going to promote brain health. And I don't think it's going to be financially sustainable to... Um, to do that. So, you know, what do we do? We have to try to identify what those opportunities are for older adults, no matter what industry they're in, that, that keep them engaged. Um, we do a lot of work abroad also, and we had our Asia Summit in Singapore, and they have a mandatory 65-year retirement date for their workers. The very next day, they're hired again by their company in a different role, and it's all mapped out beforehand, you know, their age, um, you know, age-friendly workplaces identify uh, opportunities that leverage their strengths as mentors, strategy thinking, long-term vision, takes into account their network, and they are, you know, continue their value to their company. And it does require some retraining. It does require um, retraining for the, inner, you know, the younger uh, workforce, but you know that concept of intergenerational work teams, I think, is another advantage that companies that prioritize that and do prioritize those types of reskilling for older adults will see, you know, their competitive advantage uh, over over other companies, and we'll start to kind of create this cascade of um, that type of age appropriate training, whether it's through you know these technology uh, applications whether it's through universities like Penn offering um, lifelong learning opportunities for folks to reinvent themselves. I think uh, academic centers are going to be, um, you know, a new laboratory for for involving older adults. Excellent. Do anyone on the panel's response? We have, before I take another question. Well, just, I'm not sure if it's your question either, but there are um, applications and a lot of good research about brain fitness, right? Like our brains, yes. I think there's a stigma around the fact that people think, oh, I'm getting older, my brain's on the downslope. Right. You can continue to build resilience in your brain. You absolutely yes. can continue to get sharper. So there are opportunities and there are tools evaluated by NIH and others yes. um, that are showing promise in terms of just like your physical fitness, there are opportunities with right. brain fitness. And so it's parts, not just the crossword puzzle, right? So there's right. lots of interesting technology available and becoming more and more emerging. The trick is going to be understanding what actually works and what's snake oil. So right. That's so, why yeah. Yeah, we're focused on neuroscience. Yeah. You wire the mind. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Please. I'm going to reframe it a little bit just to see if you have any thoughts on. So, we've talked about the future of work, that expanding the definition of work, caregiving is huge demands, especially in this aging and dementia space. Um, I was super interested to hear about a venture fund launched in Silicon Valley, one of the first of its kind, investing in the caring economy, because we also talked about caregivers being predominantly women yeah. and predominantly unpaid. Are you seeing any shifts, especially given the, you know, the older adult, aging adult, for opportunities for expanding our definition of work to include the caregiving that's needed for these things? So not just the tech side, which does pattern neck recognition and binary multiple choice fill in the blank answer as well, but it doesn't do all these human things involved in caregiving that are so important. Any thoughts on that? Only because I haven't heard it. But Only I, I would just say our policy in the U.S. is terrible. It's like the one of the worst in the world. I mean, we don't support caregivers. You don't Do we have a policy? I don't even. I mean, there's a lot of advocacy going on, but it's absolutely horrific, unpaid. And it, 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 yeah, so there's there's advocacy efforts to improve that, um, but we do a, that's a policy issue that needs attention. So what what is the issue that needs attention? And yeah. well, I, I, I'm off. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, probably, and I, I think there are discussions about it, but yes, it hasn't reached the policy level yet. It, it makes me think about what Chumbo was saying before about political will being so important yeah. for the care of young people, you know, children, 
uh, that we need to get more political will to change our approach to you know, development and children and so forth. And I think you know, the other vulnerable population is people in the oldest age group uh, who are both of those groups, the children and the elderly, are primarily cared for by women. And so to get political will, I think we need to have more women in positions of leadership because as long as um, you know, present company excluded, but as long as men are in positions of leadership in most places in the world, and, you know, in many places they're totally in control, there's no women involved, there's not uh, going to be that political force to, you know, to help those groups and to provide, whether it's, you know, paid time off and, uh, you know, child support for caregiving and all so, of these So what I think you're getting at, Laura, is that um, when we talk about the economic cost of, say, Dimension America, which is some triple digit big billion dollar figure typically, most of that actually is having monetized the work of caregiving. That, that, that's what you, if you say, well, how many hours, like to, I just saw a couple of caregivers today, and you survey them, how many hours did you spend supervising, et cetera, you say, okay, let's put a wage on that, and you take all the caregivers in America and you ask them, and then you can come up with an estimate, and that gets you to the triple digit billion dollar cost. So I think the irony you're getting at is that. We call it a crisis because it's so costly, and yet we don't address one of the fundamental reasons why it's costly, which is the labor of caregiving is uncompensated labor. Yes, uh, that, that's and, and bringing in all the AI discussion we've yeah. had, if like it, the, the political will, the cultural sense of expanding our definition of work so that that's right. actual work that's compensated, especially in a world where a lot of the jobs that we've had are going to be done by AI. That's what I was thinking, and I'm thinking this group, like listening to you all, it's such a huge opportunity because it's at multiple layers of it. I just don't think we've gotten past paid time off and, and yeah. you know, those sorts of things, which is great, but what about actually creating jobs for people so they have purposeful jobs mm -hmm. in a world where we care about the caring? I think Washington State is experimenting with uh, programs to pay caregivers to provide their services. It's not a huge amount, but you know, I'm not sure of other states that are doing that. Within the dementia world, CMS has just um, announced one of the, a new demonstration project focused on comprehensive dementia care, and at the center of it will be caregiver support, which has not traditionally been prioritized. So, you know, to support them, there's new billing codes that are being developed to help train. But again, there's no funding mechanism to actually pay caregivers to, to provide. This is what's the, you're referring to the guide model? Guide. Yeah, it stands for something. I don't know what it stands for, because but I know the D stands for dementia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's called the guide model. Look it up, because I think uh, when it hit, it, we were all, we in the field were like, wow, what just happened? And uh, does anyone familiar with the guide model? Uh, anyone has a company that wants to help serve caregivers and persons with dementia? Spell guide. Uh, G-U-I-D-E. Mm -hmm. God. I think it's right. guiding the care journey for dementia. <laughs> that was helpful. I just want to put a plug that you know, three months experience. before they announced, a Milken Institute put out a report called uh, Guiding the Care Journey. Yeah. Well, what's very interesting, I'm not saying, you know, directly influenced. So at the that. webinar, the Medicare, it's, it's made possible, it's not offered as a Medicare benefit. <laughs> It is offered through CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, as one of the statutorily allowed CMMI efforts to test and develop something. Uh, so it's an interesting kind of way to run around having to expand the Medicare benefit. Because remember, Medicare doesn't, by statute, is not allowed to provide long-term care services and support. So that's in the statute. You can't pay for that along with plastic surgery. Medicare can't pay for that. Um, we can, uh, you know, cosmetic surgery. So uh, I would look at it because at the webinar where Medicare rolled out and answered questions uh, about it, they had a map of the United States and it said, everyone ting where you're from, and then the map would light up and the map turned completely red. So almost every state healthcare system was there to learn about this. And um, if you read what it requires, the healthcare system has to start to deliver services and supports and they're very open and in fact it's sort of like a thousand points of light for experimenting sorry about that, um, to, you know, how are we going to do this uh, given the resources that Medicare will pay, and Medicare will pay now for this service. So it's a great opportunity, actually, I think, uh, uh, to partner with the healthcare system. And we've had at Penn some conversations already with companies about how we're going to do this in a way that recognizes we don't have enough humans to do the work, um, although humans need to do some of it. So take a look at that.
Did, it, did you have any thoughts on guide from uh, the, your perspective? Yeah. Any other questions? Topics. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So Penn Memory Center, yep. um, can you describe what are the top three things we need to do starting at age 40 to maintain our, our cognitive reserve or, or memory? At age 40 in particular. Like, I look back at <laughs> yeah, no, age 40 I, I, because that's, um, you know, yeah. selfish. <laughs> right? yeah. self you know, they talk about brain changes happening 20 years before yeah. symptoms and things like that. So, well, um, this is where I actually gesture to my colleague. In, in cardiology, because that's or, you know in, in the cardiovascular field, because that's this prime moment, which has been well described across a host of large longitudinal studies, uh, when uh, cardiovascular disease really begins to become uh, symptomatic or nearly symptomatic. And if one lives through cardiovascular disease, which many do now, mm -hmm. um, what one goes on to this experience is declines in cognition, and many studies have shown that uh, <laughs> reduction in cardiovascular risk factors, improvements in cardiovascular health are associated with a reduction of the risk of developing dementia. There's actually fewer people with dementia now than we thought there should be uh, based on all of our projections. There's still a lot of them because people, there are a lot more people living into their later ages, but this is the numbers that haven't kept up. And, and much of the explanation for that is not effective treatments for the neurodegenerative diseases, because we know we don't have those until six months ago, but treatment of heart disease. Um, as well as, to go even earlier, uh, e uh, exposure to and uh, quality education, uh, which in America is tied with socioeconomic access after education, stability of a job, up until Obamacare, access to health insurance, et cetera, um, which takes us back to policy issues as well. So yeah, uh, cardiovascular health would be one uh, that I would emphasize. And then um, <clears throat> the Global Council on Brain Health that's run by AARP, Full disclosure, I'm a member. We actually reviewed the literature on a variety of health activities, behaviors, and their relation to brain health, and came up with um, what we think are sort of the key activities where the evidence does support there's a value here to do it. None of it's a steep surprise. Cardiovascular health is one, sleep hygiene is another, social engagement is another uh, of those activities. Um, and again, for example, well, that's all very obvious, but it's a question of how to get those activities to people, you know, and, and incentive, how to build a community that lets you get out and walk. Like, there's no sidewalks. I can't go walking, you know, yeah. you, when you arrive in some suburban communities, which is ironic. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I rambled on from your talk, uh, but at 40, heart health, I think, is, is, is one of the key ones, yeah. I'd love to hear that, and uh, yeah, just, no, to underscore, <laughs> yeah. just to underscore what you're saying is that, um, you know, in the longitudinal studies that have been done, it's actually, you know, exercise and, and uh, you know, cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension uh, in midlife that predict late life cognitive decline and dementia more than, you know, the blood pressure later in life. So that's actually the crucial moment to do it. You know, we have to start earlier. And, you know, the, the studies that look at this in children, the so cardia is one large study that has people over the age of 18. You know, there's evidence there. So likely it goes back as far as childhood. And in fact, there's evidence of in utero effects. You know, so a, a mother who has cardiovascular risk factors doesn't get enough exercise, doesn't eat right, the, you know, doesn't only develop her own cardiovascular disease, but that gets passed on to the children as well. So I think we've seen you go back earlier and earlier. So it is really all about prevention. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I had a talk recently that um, uh, it was done in mouse. I don't know if it started. You take the plasma of a young mouse, mm. you put it in the old mouse, and it's cogn cognitively better. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, shall I repeat or? Uh, so the um, old mouse with the young plasma is better cognitively and physically. Uh, is it ethical to do it in, you, in people? Uh, I don't know if anybody else is. I, I think it's ethical to take plasma. You know, we tran transfuse blood and platelets and all sorts of blood products all the time. IVIG is, you know, a blood product as well. So if that works, you know, in larger studies, I, I think that's 
fine. There are obviously, you know, immune issues and other things to work out with that. But yes, there is work going on. I mean, it's what vampires have been doing for thousands of years. <laughs> Mindful of time. Uh, one last question. And this will be our last one. Yeah, so I'm thinking about the kind of opposite of, uh, or studies towards the opposite of what we saw earlier, where, you know, giving this intervention at an early age money, there was a um, study suggesting that when older individuals lost employment at, during COVID and couldn't get it back, there were huge effects on depression and their health and everything. But I think it's probably more than just the money, right? I think that there's something about meaning. What part of losing meaning at older age can we address systematically? How can we help people find meaning when they're recreating their, their lives, given that we don't have the normal transition or we're not going to have the normal transition to retirement? I, I, I'd love to take this because I was just at a recent conference. I don't think you were there, Mitch, but um, there's an organization called Hero Health that works with major companies all over the world, really on well-being programs. And I, I got to sit in on tons of research presentations about what they're finding is working. One of the things that came to the top was purpose. And I, so part of my answer to you is, I do think it is in our earlier conversation around maintaining the ability to continue to have a sense of purpose. And whether that be by volunteering in your community or continuing to work in a different capacity or in the capacity you're in, I think it matters. You know, And there's a lot of things we talk about in the Alzheimer's and dementia world about mitigating risk factors like trying to combat hypertension and tobacco. But I think there's also a lot of optimistic things that we can do about how do we promote purpose? How do we increase engagement? You know, there's a and, lot of opportunity on the upside of thinking about our potential, if you will. Um, an independent risk factor has been described for people developing dementias, uh, uh, low, low scores on measures of purpose in life. Yeah. Um, did, I don't know if you know this, but um, plants can respond to vibratory sensations. They, they actually, I don't want to say they hear, but like if you play to certain kinds of plants munching noises, the plants will start to secrete various toxic phenols to keep the caterpillars from eating them. I don't think, though, that that plant is having the meaning of an emotional experience of that. I said, what is the hell is he talking about? <laughs> what I'm talking about is um, you want to create meaning with humans? Uh, well, that's like music. We, we hear sounds like music, and out of that we get a meaningful experience. And we go to places where music is, you can think of any number of things that create meaning around the arts and related kinds of activities that are not just sensory experiences, but help you feel like you're you, and, apropos your earlier comment, connect minds. If you look at people in a symphony, there will be neurosynchrony amongst them in terms of the way they're responding to this meaningful activity. So um, we think of the arts as a sideshow, um, that you know, should be cut because they don't lead to productive jobs, but maybe we should actually spend more on them. And with that, I had the last word. <laughs>